Okay, this is the one that's going to hit Walker County. This is our Tuscaloosa tornado. That'll be going across Birmingham. And then this is the actual cold front itself, the line of storms behind it. So you can see these individual storms, and they're just mammoth. They're monster storms. Just incredible. Zooming in a little bit, I wanted to show you a, a couple of images. This is from the pre-dawn hours, 5.20 to 5.30 in the morning, 5.17 to 5.35 in the morning. And uh, if we put on the velocity data, uh, Here's the radar, greens are motions towards the radar, reds are motions away, and you can see this is this, the uh, EF3 tornado that's going to eventually go up and hit, uh, I'm sorry, it's right up here, and that is going to hit Cordova, and then this is the, the uh, tornado that goes across Coling. For those of you that are traveling I-2059, you see all the trees down um, around the Mercedes-Benz plant between here and then Tuscaloosa, that's this tornado that came through. Uh, this is the storm, the tornado that hits, it's going to hit Hackleburg. Notice the classic hook echo right here. Okay, go a little bit closer. Now, a lot of was mentioned of this is, this is what's called a debris ball. Now, what is a debris ball? Radar can't tell the difference between rain, hail, debris that's in the air. It sends out a signal, and based on the amount of signal that comes back to the radar, it just paints it, it thinks that there's a lot more precipitation going on. So the hotter the colors, reds and whites, it just means it, there's more information coming back to the radar and what this is actually being debris being picked up in the air. And notice what happens after it goes through Hackleburg and it picks it up. There were two EF5 tornadoes that hits uh, Marion and Franklin counties within an hour and then another EF3 about an hour and a half after that that uh, traveled through Franklin, Marion, and, and Lawrence counties. And this is the Tuscaloosa tornado. Uh, here's McFarland Mall. Here's the tornado as actually as it's just passed through. And here's the velocity data, just incredible. And for those of us that were working that day, Scott and Jessica from the Birmingham office are in the back of the room. They were working, um, as, as was I. And to see that debris ball and know that there was death and destruction going on was pretty dramatic for all of us, to know this is going on in real time and seeing it going on across the entire state. And just another picture showing the debris ball. All right, so the work's not done for us after the warnings. What we have to do is Doppler go out and do damage surveys. Doppler radar doesn't depict actual wind speeds. We have to actually look at the damage and from the damage assign a wind speed to the straight line winds or the tornado. Well, how do we do that? Well, there's been a lot of enhancements, and that's why it's called the enhanced Vegeta scale. And we had wind engineers. Uh, a lot of subject matter es experts, meteorologists across the country, and we came up with a lot of what are called damage indicators, and uh, we look at residences, manufactured homes, so on and so forth. And then from that, from each one of those indicators, we come up with degrees of damage. And then from that, we then look at it and then assign a wind speed. Now we can put the expected wind speed, the lower bound of wind speed to produce the damage, or the upper bound. Well, why are there three bounds? It really depends on the construction that's going on. And so we can look at pictures on the right where we can see where if you have these, I guess a lot of people call these hurricane clips, clips these fasteners, if the sill plates are held down by J-bolts, it's going to take a lot more wind and force to produce damage on this kind of a house or this kind of a structure. If we look over here on the right side, though, and we see just what are called toenail, just nails going through the sills, uh, this house was completely blown off its foundation intact because of just the house being moved because it's not uh, well built in the sense that it doesn't have these fasteners and holding everything in place. This is a picture I took in Eclectic, which is in Elmore County, northeast of Montgomery. And I, I want to just point this out. This is a nail. And basically, I found at this residence that there was one nail 
every about 48 inches apart holding down the sill plate, the board where all of your other boards fastened to to make the frame of the house. Well, what does this mean? This means that your house does well with gravity, right? All the weight is on the roof and it, you, know, I'm, you guys are the experts out there, a lot of you here. But what it really means is that it takes a lot less wind to put a force and to damage it and to destroy it either on a horizontal or an upward force. And unfortunately, that's what we see very commonly throughout the state of Alabama of these type of construction methods that it just doesn't take as much wind. And as an example, if you go out here to McFarland and 15th Avenue and you look at that horrific damage that, that's out there, we rated that EF3. Okay, it didn't get to EF4 until we got to the northeast uh, to towards Holt and other areas that got to EF4 type damage. This is uh, also an eclectic. This is what's left of a mobile home. Notice the shrubs, a lot of the trees are still standing. We cannot rate a tornado any higher than EF3 looking at this, even without other indicators to indicate anything higher than an EF3. Why is that? Because that's what it takes to do this kind of damage to a manufactured home, EF3. And according to the 2000 census, where I got this information, about 16% of all homes in the state of Alabama, and that was 320,000 at the time, are manufactured home. And 50% of all manufactured home are in five states in the southern United States. We've had a lot of injuries and a few deaths from trees falling on homes. I, I stopped, I was gonna take a picture around my house, but I was not gonna embarrass myself because I have 50, 60 foot pines all around my house for shade and protection from the hot summers, but a lot of our homes have trees all around them, and when these trees get uprooted with straight line winds, uh, they produce a lot of damage falling on homes as well. As Art and the governor mentioned, uh, it's a real dilemma from schools. Ever since the Enterprise tornado that's in southeastern Alabama in, in 2007, where an F4 hit the school, I have never seen in my career the amount of school administrators calling our office every time there's a threat of severe weather. And we're finding out many schools, and I'm not criticizing it, I'm not saying it's wrong, it's a dilemma, that they're letting these schools out when a watches are being issued. Uh, and the reason being is, from the information we're receiving, it takes about two and a half to three hours to bust these kids home. And because our events a lot of times take a long time to unfold, you could potentially have these kids you know, sheltered in place for a long period of times. I understand there's parents are going to be upset, but it's a big dilemma. And um, I haven't, I, I will be the first to admit, I have not done any uh, inspections of schools in Alabama since I've come here as the meteorologist in charge. But when I, in a previous job I was in, I went to schools all over the place, and I've been to schools in several states. And the fact of the matter is, schools, many of them don't have really good places to shelter kids. It's not a forethought of sheltering these kids in place at schools. And I'm sure you're all aware, aware of that. I think it's all about education. We have an opportunity. That's why we're here today. We have a time period where we can start educating folks. And I want to give the example of the 100-year flood. How many of you, now please be honest, how many of you believe that a 100-year flood means it's a flood that's going to occur once every 100 years? Nobody. Nobody. Everybody is that smart or they're that honest. OK. I believe you. I believe you're that smart and you're that honest. Well, this is pictures taken near the Mississippi River earlier this year. We've talked about the horrific flooding that occurred. Well, a 100-year flood means that you have a 1% chance of that flood of that magnitude occurring every year for the next 100 years. And unfortunately, we see the 100-year flood occur two, three years in a row at places. So we need to educate folks about that. We need to educate them about tornadoes as well and about the survivability. And that leads me into this um, slide. And we have seen since 1985 the number of tornado reports, tornado, actual tornadoes, just skyrocket across the state. Now, I don't think the actual number of tornadoes are increasing. It's just that with the new technologies, cell phones, Twitters, instantaneous information, communication, we're getting a lot more reports because we can't count it as a tornado unless somebody actually sees it or it's reported or we do a damage survey. But the interesting part is notice that with the exception of this year, 
the number of EF2 or greater tornadoes has remained nearly constant. And this graph looks very similar nationwide as well. So what that's saying is the weaker tornadoes, the EF0s and 1s, are, are growing, but the EF2 and greater are remaining about the same. Well, what does that tell me in summary? That here in Alabama, about 84% of all tornadoes are EF0s and 1s, 15% are EF2 and 3s, and about 1% or less are the violent tornadoes. We had many people that didn't do the right things on April 27th and lived. We had a lot of people, many people that did the, the right things and died. These events are historic and are relatively rare, but the fact of the matter is most of our tornadoes are survivable here in Alabama and nationwide if people have the right places to go, they have the proper shelters, and they take the, the proper actions they get the warning, they know what to do, and they take the proper precautions. Like I mentioned, this was a very rare and historic event, but the question isn't if it will happen again, it's a question of when it will happen again and where. There's a lot of comparisons saying that, well, okay, this is about 35 years since the 74 outbreak, a little bit more than that. Uh, then there was a big outbreak that occurred uh, in 1932. So people are saying, well, 30 to 40 years is about the length of time when we have these just horrific outbreaks. Well, it may be another 30 or 40 years. It may be next year. It may not be in Alabama. It may be in another state close by. But it is going to happen again, unfortunately. So I really appreciate the time to explain what happened here about the meteorology. We're there in the back after this presentation is over to talk to you about weather, questions you might have, anything like that. So with that, thank you.